So hello everyone. Uh, this is ENI monthly webinars hosted by uh, Center for Research Ethics and Bioethics at Uppsala University in collaboration with the European Network for Academic Integrity. My name is Sonia Bielababa. And today with us, we have Rita Santos and Salim Razi from the Faith Project. And they are going to talk about support for victims of academic misconduct, an interactive portal and support network uh, that's developed as a part of a faith project in collaboration with ENI. So, uh, Ita, would you like to tell us a couple of words uh, about yourself? About me? Um yeah, well, so thank you first, uh, Sonia and the and NI for the invitation and the Center for uh, Research Ethics and Bioethics from Uppsala University. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to talk, to give the space to talk about the topic that it's often not really talk, uh, talked in, in our community. And it's such an important topic, a topic to raise awareness on the, on the, on the victims of academic misconduct. Um, so my name is Rita Santos. I'm currently uh, replacing our beloved Dita, which is in maternity leave um, as a NI executive director. I'm also a senior researcher and project manager at NI. And um, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, so before you do, help. perhaps we can just give a few minutes. Uh, ah. to Salim as well to present himself. Salim, okay. you are the leader of the Faith Project and coming from Chanakala University, Turkey. Uh, thank you, Sonia, for the invitation uh, for this presentation to disseminate uh, the project uh, further to uh, our NI colleagues and uh, for NI partners. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, I'm the coordinator of uh, the FAITH project and I'm also joining from uh, Çanakkale on Six Mart University, Turkey. Uh, I'm uh, the director of the Center for uh, Academic Integrity there. And uh, I've been involved in the INAI board as well. So it's our pleasure here today uh, to talk about uh, the FAITH project and mainly uh, the the third project result of the FAITH project, which is uh, support for victims portal, uh, which is uh, led by INAI, I mean, uh, Rita. So uh, we will all have a lot to learn from uh, Rita here about recent developments regarding the portal. Thank you. So Rita, you will tell us more about this portal and afterwards I'll get back to you, Salim, uh, to tell us more about uh, the FAITH project and what's more to expect there. So Rita, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you, Salim, for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen and reduce. So again, thank you for this invitation. And today uh, I want to start by, well, I already start a, a brief introduction, but I want to context, contextualize more my, uh, who I am and my background. And then I want us to reflect uh, together on whether victims of academic misconduct feel supported. And this is an important topic for us to, today to discuss. Um, before, so so then we can go and talk and and go in detail about our victim support portal. As Salim said, is one of the outputs of the Faith Project, uh, and the, and the rationale that we we had to develop this portal. And I wanna um, I, I wanna take the last few minutes of the this webinar today to talk about the lessons that we learned so far from the victims that we have been supporting. And of course, uh, answer your question and answers. You are welcome to leave your questions in the chat uh, throughout the, this presentation today. And then we will reserve some time to answer your questions. And then as Sonia said, we will have Salim again to talk about the future of the Erasmus Plus Faith project and the victim support portal. So who am I? I already said I'm uh, NI executive director, senior researcher and project manager, and I'm the coordinator of the victim support portal and the working group that we have at NI about supporting victims, victims of academic misconduct. And I think it's important for you to understand um, my background and how I ended up 
working in academic integrity. You see, uh, I was, um, I, my background is in marine biology, but then I went to the UK to do my PhD. And when doing my PhD, I was a victim of mis uh, academic misconduct. Uh, but I took the my experience and the situation that I was facing uh, on the positive side, um, on, 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 on an aspect that how can I help others in the future? So having that in mind, then when I finished my PhD, I enrolled as a junior researcher at the H2020 Integrity Project. Um, you will have this presentation, so then you can uh, have a look at the project. This was a project uh, that already finished and had as a aim to develop educational materials on academic integrity and responsible conduct for, for students uh, from high school until PhD level. Um, and then I wanted to continue. I wanted to continue working with the, with the expert in this area, and I couldn't find a better family to work with than NI, uh, to continue to raise awareness on, on, on academic integrity and the importance of fostering academic integrity. Um, because when we talk about uh, uh, quality of academic work of, of the scientific output, uh, we are talking about the principles of academic integrity, uh, the honesty, respect, respect with others, accountability for your research and your work, uh, ethical values, morality. But we need to consider also the, the dark side, what, what I like to call the dark side, the bad side, academic misconduct. And, it, and, and, and this unfortunately happens uh, in our community. We have cases of plagiarism, data manipulation, contract cheating, those kind of uh, behaviors that undermine the trust in the, in the scientific output, in the quality of the work and in the relationship uh, among peers when we think about uh, the un unbalance uh, of the relationship between a supervisor and the, uh, and, and the student. And I, I was recently interviewed uh, uh, to talk about the, the victim support portal by a Czech uh, uh, mag a magazine for universities, uh, Universitas. Um, and the, the journalist, she asked me, uh, Rita, how prevalent, how common are uh, our, our academic misconduct practice? Uh, do all researchers engage in this? Is this so frequently? And I said to her, um, we, saying that it's, is it frequently that we all do? No, we, 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 we don't. But perhaps the, the, what we need to take into account is that we are raising attention to these cases. We are researching about these cases. We have the example from F Finale that says that 2% of researchers admitted having manipulated data and 34 other questionable practice. Um, but when the interesting part here, although this is alarming, but the interesting part is when, uh, when we assess the, the, the behavior of the colleagues, the perception of colleagues who have seen or suspect that their fellows are engaging in any questionable practice or, or, or misconduct itself, the admission rates are much higher. And I wonder, and I, and I would like us today to reflect how many of these cases are actually reported to their institutions uh, and how we as a community can work so these numbers uh, instead of ri rising, uh, they drop, and this is the important. Uh, th this is an important as uh, uh, takeoff message that we need to 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 work with, um, and especially when we when we see also the results from the this year Nature Postgraduate Survey, it's alarming and it's it is shocking that our students uh, and master and PhD students, they face high levels of stress and poor work-life balance and struggle with anxiety or depression. And when we, when we go deeper on these results, then we see that um, when we have the question, do you feel that you have experienced bullying during your, your graduate degree? 18% said yes. This is shocking. And this should bring us to reflect what we are doing wrong or how we as an institution are failing to our students. And then when we talk about uh, 
are you able to speak without fearing the consequences? More than the house said, no. I mean, we have our students. I mean, when I say students, this might be translated also, and this is likely to be translated to researchers itself. People are feeling afraid to speak about uh, being mistreated during their studies, during their research, about bad actions that they see. They feel afraid of speaking up, of raising their voice because of the fears of the consequences. And this is alarming. This is shocking. This shows that we as a community, instead of building this secure place for people to report, we are actually building this fear for someone to speak up uh, uh, to speak up uh, about an act, a bad action, uh, afraid of the consequences, afraid of not getting a PhD, a master's degree, afraid of not having a career, afraid of being uh, um, uh, judged by the peers. And who are, who was the perpet the per perpetrator, the supervisor? How we, as a community, can 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 work on better supervisions. Uh, how supervisors are are failing this this needs to be to be uh, reflected um so we don't end up in having students saying that i would do nothing to change is this nothing because they are hopeless because they don't see a point of reporting because they are afraid of reporting and ultimately supervisors should be the role models and as I said at the beginning, I was a victim of misconduct. And without going into details about what happened, um, I just want to say that uh, sometimes if you need to fish some sharks, you should fish some sharks. You know, if they, the, imba the, 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 the imbalance of the relationship between a supervisor and, and the student and the supervisee, um, is already high, and supervisors should think about how they 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 supervise their students. And the institution itself needs to protect the student and the student law. So sometimes, if we need to go to the higher fish, let's fish th that without fearing the consequence, without fearing the um, the bad reputation that 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 might bring. But we need to think clearly how each one of us can work in our own institutions. Um, and having that in mind, uh, there's also the concept, who is a victim? Uh, and there's a, there's a negativity side, an emotional context about, uh, context about a victim, because often someone who is facing, uh, uh, who is being mistreated, who is facing some kind of misbehavior from other, uh, don't want to really assume uh, that I am a victim because of the, the connection, the strong uh, connection with the words. Uh, but we see this. We see this when uh, we have uh, either uh, the PhD that stole the data. We see this when uh, even as a teacher, you see your materials being sold on the Internet or the paper was plagiarized. So, yes, you are a victim and you have a voice and your voice needs to be heard. And this is an important thing to consider, uh, not be afraid to speak up, but, but it needs to be at, uh, given the space to speak, uh, to, to tell your, your issue, to tell with confidence and with the hope that the, you, what you are, the issue that you are raising will be heard and will be dealt appropriately in your own institution, in your own setting. Um, so I have here different uh, types of different uh, different situations, different actions that uh, bring us as a victim. Even, for example, people that blow the whistle, the, the whistle, the whistleblowers. How are these people protected? How they they can blow the whistle and still have a career? And I'll go back to this just in a minute later in the presentation. So. When I ask, do victims of academic misconduct feel supported? There's few research 
uh, first, there's few research on report on actually reporting academic research misconduct and the impact on both the victims and the people they 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 accuse. And it's important to have in in mind that filling charges uh, can be risky and can be risky uh, because, as I said, the fear of the consequences, the fear of uh, uh, the for career for for the reputation among peers. Um, but ultimately, this is a responsibility for all of us. This is a responsibility as a community to speak when we see, when we suspect of something is not right. Uh, but speaking, when, when we speak, we need to speak resp with responsibility. And this is a, a very, very important word that, that I would like us all to have it in mind here. There's always two sides on every story. There's always two sides. There's two sides of, of the con. We have the victim perspective and uh, the, um, the respondent's perspective, and both need to be protected. Um, and having that in mind, when we, when we see that something is not right, uh, th this paper from Gonzalez brings us a very, very important perspective that we need perhaps to consider be, before raising the formal complaint. Uh, and this is, the, the, there's a set of rules um, that are very important and all rules go back to the first one. So when you when we see something that it might, mm, this might not be look good. Let's, is this really a misconduct? There might be other explanation. Cons and, and consider that you might be wrong. You might not have the clear picture of everything. You might you might not have are you might not be in the possession of 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 all the information you need to make a, a claim that yes this is a misconduct. Um, let's first ask questions. F approach the person that you are with some kind of suspicion, and if the person doesn't answer your questions, then ask yourself rule number three. What do, documentation supports my concern? Do I have all the data I need, all the proofs that I need to go ahead with my claim? Do I have access to it? Do I have it uh, uh, written and, and, and in my in my fold? Because this will be important later on if you decide to raise a complaint. This will be critical, uh, critical to show to the investigation committee that you actually have supporting documents from for, for your claims and not not based on uh, someone said this said that said that uh, actual facts actual facts and rule number four is also crucial here separate your per personal from your professional concerns how many cases do we know that uh, are actually motivated by some sort of jealousy, uh, misinterpretations, miscommunication among teams. Um, how many cases do we know that are actually miscommunication and mistreatment than the ones that are actually misconduct uh, cases? And this is important. Stick to the facts, stick with your professional relationship and not your personal uh, conflict with someone. And rule number five, assess your goals. What are you seeking from this situation? Ask yourself, what do I want from this situation? Is, just, is this just a matter of making what is right, being a, a responsible uh, academic, being a responsible student, being a responsible researcher, making raising a complaint because someone is going to publish a paper based on data that was somehow, for example, fabricated, uh, but are you are you sure what you're saying? Because this is these are uh, very serious accusations. You need to be aware. And what are you seeking? How many cases we see dealt at uh, public uh, public eye that people go to the to the journals and they report the situation and without actually based on uh, on on a uh, on, on a clear process on a uh, on on all the evidence but if you take all the boxes for all these rules you you have you have seen seen something or if you uh, you are experiencing something that doesn't look right you have uh, approached the person 
uh, you have tried to understand the situation, you have asked all the questions, you have all the data you, you need to support your claims, you have all the evidence, uh, you separate, it's not a matter of personal, uh, you know, work dispute, a personal um, a real problem with someone. You have assessed your goals, what you are seeking from this situation, then talk with someone that uh, would might not be that that might be unbiased and seek the advice and listen to it this for example could be the ethics officer from your institution that would then uh, help you on the process uh, to 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 make a formal complaint so if you are sure about your obligation you will need to initiate the formal proceedings but please be prepared for the long process these are a long process these are process that challenge you on the personal and professional level um, and learn from the, the process, learn from uh, the, the entire process, how the institution supported you during the process, how the policies that were, are in place or the procedures, procedures that are in place um, should be revised. How can I work with, with, with the institution to make these uh, policies and procedures more clear and more straightforward, how the process itself could evolve. And when the, the, the investigation reached to the, to the end and the person, the, the, the person that is accused uh, is found guilty or, or not, um, but it has, has gone through the process, let's avoid continue blaming the person because uh, and this is an important. This is a very. There's a, a very interesting uh, article from uh, Lex Balter and Hendrix about both whistleblowers and the scientists they accuse are vulnerable and deserve protection. And this is something, as I said at the beginning, if we need to fish some sharks, let's fish some sharks. But let's also try to return the shark to the to the sea and help navigate in the right tide, in the right waters. Because we as a community, we should report the cases that we see, but also help the help the person, help the person to retreat, to be to be better, to make better next time. How many cases do we know of students that have committed plagiarism because they actually were not taught in the right way? They were not taught. Uh, on academic integrity, on good academic in, on academic in, uh, practice, we need we need to raise these cases, but support each other and support both the victim and the person that did something not good. If the person show willingness to improve, to make better for the next time, how many of us have a second chance in life? You know, so let's let's contribute for making this community, the scientific community, a space for making better, make, make helping each other to be better researchers, be better uh, teachers, be better students. And having that in mind, and because NI has received uh, over, over the years requests for support, uh, for people sh asking for, for support from NI on, on the cases that they were dealing, uh, in 2019, and I established a new working group, the support for victims of academic misconduct. And um, the work developed during this, wor this working group was uh, the prototype of the interactive web portal for victims of academic malpractice. And this prototype was presented at NI annual conference in 2020 in Dubai. Uh, and later on was included in the FATE project. And this this was important to enable further develop and continue uh, this uh, this supporting platform for victims of academic um, uh, mis misconduct and to allow uh, long term support for for victims. So, um, as Salim already mentioned at the beginning, and I'm going I'm going I'm going to explain this briefly. Uh, the Erasmus. Play, uh, Erasmus Plus Fate Project is a project that is currently uh, running. It will run until February of 2025. Uh, NI is a partner along with four other partners and it's coordinated by uh, Salim from the Çanakkale University in Turkey. It has three uh, main, three uh, outputs and the victim support portal is 
part of the, the, the PR3, where we aim to establish an interactive portal and support network for victims of academic misconduct. So what we have done so far in PR3, uh, we, have, we are currently un, uh, trying to understand the different needs of our potential victims. And we are doing this through a literature review, uh, literature review about um, the, um, the different target groups, students, researchers, academics, on their uh, perception, experience, and the and important uh, aspect here is the supporting uh, service available at institutions for victims. We are trying to do a, a literature review on the supporting uh, mechanisms for victims. And we are also working on uh, developing an online survey to assess the the needs of our of 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 victims of of of, mal, of academic and research malpractice, and then we have our victim support um, portal, that in PR three B, and in uh, along with the victim support portal, we are uh, developing educational materials and mentoring support. This webinar, for example, will be available will be, will be made available in our victim support portal. Uh, but we have also developed other other materials. We have developed uh, videos explaining how to navigate in the portal. We have developed uh, presentations, and we are giving this mentoring support that I will be talking just in a minute. So. Uh, I invite you all to have a look at the victim support portal. You might have seen uh, through NI uh, newsletter and NI social media. We have been promoting a lot our portal. We have been uh, every month. There's uh, the presentation of our mentors. There's also uh, the, the, the presentation of our, our our resources. For example, on the story section, on the blog, on the on on the resource as well. Um, and as I said, our aim in the victim support portal is to establish a confidential support network for anyone who is facing any issue related to academic or research malpractice, who have a space, a secure space, to report the situation and, 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 and obtain advisory service from uh, our mentors. Um, we have mentors that are experts in academic and research um, integrity and, are, and dedicate their time in supporting people. Um, and ultimately, uh, we raise awareness for, on the need of, to implement effective supporting mechanisms for victims um, to, to, to have a space to share their concerns and to uh, be guided on the kind of actions that they might, uh, that, that, that they may, might, 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 might do. So ultimately, why we have developed this this portal, I have already um, already uh, explained you uh, our aims. But to whom is this portal? Uh, was this portal built? Anyone, absolutely anyone, seeking the advice. We provide advice for anyone who might be struggling with the case, with, with an issue, who might be uh, trying to find some. So, sort of actions to, to take some the steps to follow from students, researchers, academic staff, journal editors, ethics officers, integrity officers. We help anyone. And we don't, we, 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 we provide advice to anyone uh, globally. So uh, although we have currently our portal in English, we aim to also, we also, uh, uh, we will also provide advice to people that uh, reach to us in different language. For example, the interview that I gave is currently available both in English and in Czech. And how and how can you uh, obtain support from us? You simply describe your problem uh, to, to us, and I'll, I'll show you how just in, 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 a, in a second. Uh, you describe your problem. And, you're, you, and, and you will receive the advice from our mentors, and this communication will be 100% uh, private. Will be private from from the, the, the minute you submit your 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 case 
to the to the advice that the mentor will provide you. So uh, in terms of workflow, you describe your issue, uh, and this is private by default when asking for support. Then the your your uh, request for support is only visible to the administrators and the mentors of the portal that, as I said, were, are experts in uh, academic and research integrity. These mentors are researchers and academics from the FATE project, but also from the uh, NI Extended Network. They assess your case um, and how we decide on the mentor, we decided based on the nature of the case and the expertise of the mentor. So for example, I am an administrator. When I receive a, uh, a request for support, I, uh, I um, along with the two other administrators, we assess together who is the mentor more suitable to provide the advice. And the mentor, maybe one or, or two, uh, they assess and discuss their ca the case and provide the, the set of advice to the people that to the person that reported the situation uh, through the portal. All communications are made through the portal. And this is important to secure confidentiality, privacy. Um, it's important to keep all our conversations through the portal. Um, so if you if you if you if you are facing any um, any any issue and you'd like to get support, or if you know someone who might be struggling with a with a case and would like to receive support, um, you can do it in the ask uh, questions section. Uh, as I said, private whose posts are private by default. You might select the category, um, and this is it, this help us because uh, it might help it, it help us then to uh, facilitate the 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 allocation of the mentors. You no know, match the category with the expertise of the mentor, and you might select the mentor, but this is optional. Um, and you might select the mentor based on their expertise. If you go um, in the victim support portal section menu, uh, and then you click, there's the list of mentors. Uh, I'm going to show you in a minute, but the, each mentor has their expertise there. You just click on the mentor and you are able to see the expertise. And then if you want, you choose the mentor that you would like to obtain support from. Um, something that is important to consider here is we ask for the email of uh, of the the person when uh, submitting the request for support. This email is only for sending a notification email when the mentor has reached to you uh, and to, to to send you a notification email uh, that your your case was su successfully uh, uh, sent to to our team um, and this is only available to the administrators of the portal so we don't for for of course for for privacy uh, privacy um, concern we only use the the the, the email for that for sending notification emails. And this is explained uh, in the frequently asked uh, questions in the portal. So when, when you submit your question, uh, your request for support, you, um, you, you, you are gar guaranteed that your, your, your case will be dealt privately. It won't be vis visible uh, publicly in the portal and only visible to the administrators and mentors of, uh, of the portal. So as I said, uh, who are our mentors? There are researchers and academics from the FATE project and NI, uh, experts in different topics of uh, research and, tech, and specific, and, and, and they are here to dedicate their time in supporting anyone, so this is actually a, um, an opportunity that uh, that other other places don't don't have, other in, and especially institutions that we gather here uh, the minds, the expertise of people that have been dedicating their life in doing great work in in integrity issues, and they are knowledgeable in terms of what actions. Can, Actions can be done according to some to 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 the nature of the case, and um, and 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 they are here 
to support, and that's the important part. Without any judgment, uh, they are here to support anyone. Uh, let me just be cautioned on time. Okay, so as I said, I've been uh, um, I've been um, advertising every month. Um, our mentors, for example, this month we will be advertising uh, Irene from the Co Coventry University at UK. Uh, and you are you are welcome to 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 click on on, on each mentor, uh, learn their expertise, and 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 you you but you can only connect with them by asking by by asking for support. Uh, we, we don't offer the emails from the from the mentors to be contacted privately. Um, we also make uh, some cases public in our portal in the discussion forum, uh, and these cases are made public with the informed consent from the, from the victim and with anonymization of all details. And why do we see this important, to make some cases public? First, some cases that reach to us reflect common situations, situations that, that we have seen, uh, that we have been uh, asked for support before, and they have some a, a common ground. And we see this making a, a case public, of course, as I said, anonymiz anonymizing all, all the personal details, and particularly making the advice that the mentors gave to this, this specific case might actually be supporting other people uh, facing a similar problem. So with the discussion forum, we aim to support other users that visit our portal and but might be struggling with the same situation. And when they read the situation uh, and they read the advice provided by the mentors, they, they feel empowered. They feel, uh, they, they, they feel that they know the necessary steps to take to, to, to their case if it's a similar case. And this way, we raise awareness. We we support people, and we 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 aim to people to interact. Um, we allow uh, users to comment on the cases, but be sure that anyone can comment on the case on a public case in the discussion forum, uh, on the stories, on the blog, uh, as well. But any comment that is made is first made private and pending approval because we want to make sure the appropriate language that is used, uh, there's no su su such um, sort of um, harassment, negative language, because as I said, ultimately we want to make this as a, as an engaging community, a supportive, uh, supporting community that uh, people feel um, feel uh, secure to to share their issues. Others may get may may support by providing their advice as well. Uh, but we don't want any. We want to avoid any kind of uh, bad, uh, bad bad language, uh, some kind of harassment. So all comments are first assessed by our team. Um, and we 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 specify this in our aims and guidelines in our portal. Uh, we have also a dedicated a dedicated section of, to talk about the Erasmus Plus Faith Project, the information also about NI. Um, and we have uh, the set of stories, a blog, and a resource. We have a set of resources available for our users. The story section, for example, uh, is made of uh, uh, real cases that were advertised in uh, in a, a reliable um, magazine, reliable articles in in, in news, uh, and that reflect different topics of academic misconduct. Misconduct, for example, we have plagiarism, we have uh, bullying, we have uh, data uh, data manipulation. Uh, the blog is a is an important component of our of our portal, where we our 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 mentors and extended network share personal reflections uh, related to, to to academic integrity, to academic misconduct, uh, and our resources provide relevant bibliography that people can download, uh, guideline documents as well, and and as I said, our webinar 
will be made available in the resource section. And I invite everyone to contribute. We are happy to receive. If you see that there's a, a case um, that was uh, advertised in, 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 in news, in, 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 in uh, for example, Pleasurism Today or, or other resources, um, feel free to email me uh, this story. If you want to contribute with the blog, uh, with the blog text, share share your story. Also, feel free to 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 send it. Uh, and we allow, as I said, open discussions and hope open and healthy, uh, positive discussions. So in every story, you will see uh, at the end a set of questions to promote this discussion, to to get people to talk, to talk about the topics, to talk about their views and how how they, they see these problems could be tackled. And this is our way also to, to, to build this, this community, to try to make to change things, to try to make it uh, uh, our institutions to reflect on, on how to approach cases. Um, as I said, this is just an example of our stories uh, we, under topics of pleasure and data manipulation. Um, the blog as well. Our blogs will will be out every two months, uh, and you will be happy to. We you are welcome to leave your comments and contribute as well. I will get back to the blog at the end of my presentation today of my webinar today. Um, guidelines, bibliography. Again, we welcome your contributions. Uh, and we have the frequently asked questions section of the portal, and this is important to clarify some some uh, some concerns that our users might have, particularly on privacy and confidentiality issues, um, and to make sure that uh, and this is an important uh, consideration to take. We uh, can only provide advice. We can only provide a set of advice of on, on the actions that the person uh, that is requesting for our support may take, but we don't have the power. We don't have a. We are not a legal a legal uh, advisory service uh, to uh, influence and to contact uh, third parties. And this is something that is important. We provide only advice. We don't interfere with the with we, we don't interfere. Sorry, it's not the word, but we don't uh, contact um, the the institutions or the the person that is under the claim of uh, of misconduct. So, in terms of uh, the the impact of, of the victim support so far, uh, we have made two conference presentations. One uh, at during the NI annual conference in Porto this year. Uh, also, an, another uh, the Porto was re, was presented um, in October this year in the Kikiai 10 year anniversary conference. We've made one leaflet that is available in our portal in the section educational materials um, and was presented in the World Conference of Research Integrity. We have made also local disseminations on during the NI PhD summer school this year, presentations made also by product partners. And as I said, I, I, I gave an interview about the, about the portal that is available in, in, um, in the educational section as well, available both in English and in Czech. And since the portal was officially launched in May until now, um, we have supported cases privately. One case was made public after, of course, anonymization of all details and with the, the consent consent from the per, from the victim. Uh, and our cases reflect uh, have been reflecting cases of plagiarism, uh, working dispute, working uh, conflict between between uh, be, between the peer, peers. Uh, about the peer review process itself, some some issues about publication ethics uh, and research data issues. And so far, we have had uh, over 5,700 page views, and we have users from over 500. We have sorry, we have uh, uh, over 500 users from 60 countries. So we are attracting attention, we are supporting people, we are building this uh, amazing work on supporting uh, people who have been uh, mistreated, who, 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 feel, who feel 
uh, the need to get guidance on the uh, on on unethical behaviors from others, but we would like you to spread the word. So to if you know someone who is struggling, feel free to direct to, to our portal, and we will we are here to support everyone. And lessons learned from the portal so far, and this reached the, this reaching the end of my webinar. So in terms of the lessons that we've learned uh, from the cases that we have been supporting, uh, I think the first lesson that we've been learned that we learned is there's always an emotional context uh, when someone approach us to request for to, to explain the case and request for support. There's always an emotional uh, setting, and uh, and and it, it's it's understandable because. Uh, these situations are usually difficult situations. Um, these, these are uh, uh, requests for, for help. But one thing that we've learned is that details matter. Uh, the more detailed your case is, the better the support with our mentors can provide. Uh, if you remember at the beginning of my webinar, when I, when I mentioned rule number three from the article of Gonzalez, uh, about do are are you in um, do you have all the data all the, all the all the information that supports your claim? This is critical. This is critical uh, that we that that when someone uh, approaches, reports and provides all the details. And um, another thing is, as I said, we can only provide support. We don't interact with anyone else. And um, it's something that it, we, we've been discussing and that we learn is that we only hear one side of the story. And in every story, there's two sides. So we can only work with one side of the story. We can only provide the advice based on one uh, on, on, on the story that is told by the, the, the victim or, or the, the, the person that is reporting itself. And sometimes um, there's been cases where uh, we uh, where we provide a set of actions, uh, structured actions, or uh, uh, for the person on knowing what to do to deal with the case. But there's other there's been other other cases where the person has done everything in in the power, um, has done everything uh, to to deal with the situation. And this tells a lot also to the institutions itself about the procedures that they have, about uh, how transparent, how accessible those procedures are, and how and the mechanisms of the of support that those institutions have, and how what needs to be changed. Uh, so the majority of the less, if I if I if I was asked to enumerate, is. Um, Although the cases are, are bring some emotion, emotions, try to be as objective as possible. Provide all the details. Um, be um, be sure of of your claims, and we are here to support. But we can only uh, give the advice and not uh, talk on your behalf with your institutions. And to finalize. Um, Positivity is and learning from the process is key when dealing with cases of academic misconduct, uh, and this and this is something that I invite you to have a look at the blog text from a, from a from a victim that shared her story with us, um, and it's a pow powerful testimony of someone that has taken. Uh, her situation in a positive way, in a positive uh, mindset, to 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 employ a set of actions and to take the most about the situation, to learn from the process and not be um, taking negativity, revenge, resentment, uh, because this help this this person to to improve, to to work with the institution and and receive the support from the institution. To, um, to 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 for example to 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 employ training in academic integrity that's what is one one of the actions that is mentioned in in the in the text uh, to to inspire uh, the new generation of researchers on academic integrity training on the good practice uh, and this is something that is 
critical positivity and learn not not assume your role as a victim as always on a negative side but on something to empower you to first speak up tell your story learn from the process take the process and uh, help others facing situations that uh, that um, that are of course difficult and that undermine uh, well, ultimately academic misconduct that undermine the trust in, in, in science. And I thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, thank you very much. So thank you so much, Rita. Uh, this is really an important uh, uh, aspect of, of uh, academic integrity uh, and uh, I wish you good luck with the portal. Salim, I would like to ask you just uh, what's next in the project? Uh, thank you, Rita, for the wonderful presentation. I believe uh, this provides good insights uh, to the audience today about what we have achieved so far relating to the portal. Indeed, uh, considering the FATE project, we have three main outputs. Uh, the first output deals with uh, policies, institutional academic integrity policies, where we uh, focus on give specific attention to uh, good practice. For this purpose, uh, in the first year, uh, indeed, we haven't finished the first year yet, but uh, so far, uh, within the last uh, eight or nine months, uh, we tried to collect policies uh, globally relating to institutional academic integrity policies. So we are now creating a corpus and uh, at the end of uh, the first year, uh, we will have created our corpus. And for the next year, uh, we will conduct analysis uh, to, to our corpus. Uh, in our corpus, uh, we are collecting institutional policies with some good samples and also with some uh, issues that should be uh, should be developed. Uh, our ultimate goal uh, with the policy analysis is uh, indeed providing exemplary policies uh, to the institutions because uh, when we were drafting uh, our proposal for the project, uh, this was the issue that uh, we called attention. Uh, earlier, our colleagues, such as, for example, Irene Glendening and uh, uh, Tomas, uh, they already uh, conducted some uh, research and some project relating to this, and we already know that uh, institutions uh, across Europe and beyond Europe, uh, they uh, there are some institutions suffering from policies, poorly written policies, or there are still some insti institutions without any academic integrity policies. So our goal uh, with the first project result is uh, providing some suggestions for the pol uh, for the institutions to develop or uh, to revise uh, their policies by taking uh, exemplary policies into account. For this purpose, uh, our uh, first target group is indeed accreditation agencies. Uh, since the project uh, is coordinated by uh, Çanakkale on Six Mart University, which is located in Turkey, uh, so far. Uh, I, I contacted uh, the higher education, uh, Turkish uh, higher education accreditation agency, the president, and the president uh, of the agency is following uh, our project very closely, and uh, they ensured me that they will take our results into consideration uh, so that, uh, indeed, uh, for the accreditation of Turkish higher education institutions, uh, the project results uh, seem to uh, contribute uh, in the accreditation pro uh, process. And meanwhile, uh, I received another in, uh, invitation from uh, Senka. Uh, this is uh, Central and uh, I believe Eastern European Higher Education Accreditation Agency Network. So uh, I'll be familiarizing them with our projects and hopefully uh, if, if they agree to uh, collaborate or cooperate with us, uh, of course, we will be sharing our results with them. 
So which means that uh, we will have a better impact uh, through Europe for the for the European universities. This is this is the first aspect relating to uh, project result one, and the other one uh, for the second project result. This time uh, we we focused on our proactive approach uh, to deter academic uh, mis academic misconduct. For this purpose, for the second project result, we focus on educational materials. So uh, indeed, uh, throughout the project, we give priority to a pedagogical approach. Uh, as you can already remember from uh, Rita's presentation, okay, uh, we are dealing with academic misconduct cases. However, we are not blaming anyone. Uh, indeed, we are trying to understand the roots of the problems and uh, we are trying to have an approach, uh, have a preventive approach uh, to, to prevent these problems occur. I mean, if this is because of students, let's say, for example, in the case of uh, plagiarism, if this is because of students, then uh, we try to teach students uh, some, some issues, uh, some preventive uh, plagiarism strategies. Or if we realize that, oh, this is because of uh, lectures, let's say, for example. So what is missing there? So we try to develop some materials, some pedagogical materials that will be helpful, uh, both for the promotion of academic integrity and for the prevention of uh, academic misconduct. Since we uh, proposed this uh, re uh, project proposal uh, during COVID, uh, we also try to include, give some priority to digitalization and also uh, emergency remote teaching. And for this purpose, uh, considering, uh, considering the educational pedagogical activities under uh, the second project result, uh, we also uh, try to collect and develop some materials uh, relating to this issue as well. And you already know about uh, the third project result, which is support for victims. So indeed, they are all uh, completing each, each other. Uh, before, before I finalize, uh, I'd like to inform uh, the audience here about the summer schools in IE. Uh, academic integrity PhD summer school. Indeed, uh, we organized the first summer school in 2021. And uh, later uh, this summer, uh, the second one, uh, the second in I summer school. Uh, at the time of project proposal submission, uh, there was no summer school. So it was not indeed included as summer school in the project proposal. However, later after organizing the first uh, in I summer school, we decided to turn our uh, learning, teaching, training activities into in I summer schools. And this year, uh, we organized a summer school in Chanakkale, and it was indeed a pilot activity. Next year, uh, we will be organizing the, uh, the other summer school uh, in Maribor, uh, and uh, it will be uh, a collaboration, uh, a learning, teaching, training activity of uh, the FAITH project. And for uh, 2024, uh, the summer school, PhD summer school, will be in Constance as another uh, learning, training, teaching activity of the project. So I'd like to encourage especially PhD students uh, to take these uh, PhD summer schools, which are free activities. Uh, for, for, for PhD, some, uh, PhD students uh, to take them into consideration. Uh, Maribor Summer School will be in August, uh, the third week August, and uh, Constance Summer School will be in the second week of September in 2024. 20, uh, please uh, subscribe to our newsletter, in our newsletter, so that uh, you don't miss any, any of these uh, free opportunities. And we have uh, two multiplier events. We already organized the first multiplier event in Porto as the uh, NI annual conference. And in 2024, we will be organizing uh, the last multiplier event uh, of the project uh, as uh, annual NI conference uh, in Chanakkale. Probably uh, the conference will be uh, during summer, probably in August. Uh, so the delegates uh, will be able to enjoy sun here in addition to uh, attending, uh, attending sessions. 
Thank you once again for joining us today. And thank you once again, uh, Rita, for the wonderful presentation and Sonia for hosting us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, what a finish of, of uh, these ENI uh, webinars for this year. Uh, I wish you both good luck with the project and uh, please sign up for our newsletter. You can find more information on the project uh, and as well as the summer school and the uh, conferences uh, on our website, academicintegrity.eu. And next year, we will continue with the webinars. The first one is February 10th with Anna Albakina, who is going to talk about the rising threat of paper mills. After that, we will continue with many different subjects, such as gamification in academic integrity, survey design, we'll talk about our conference, and we will present a brand new working group that is within ENI called Ethical Academic Writing. So stay tuned, uh, more information is coming. This webinar has been recorded. If you missed some of us, our previous webinars, you can find them on our website as well as on the ENI YouTube channel. Thank you so much for today. Return, Salim, and good luck with your project. Thank you.